Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Life Interrupted webinar, part of a webinar series in collaboration with the McGill Alumni Association and the Life After Your Degree program. With us today is Professor Richard Kessner to discuss ways on how to best stay productive during a once in a century pandemic. Richard Kessner is a professor of psychology at McGill University, where he has conducted research on personality and human motivation for over 30 years. He did his PhD research at the University of Rochester and completed a postdoctoral fellowship at Harvard University. Professor Kessner has published over 200 scientific articles and his recent work focused on how to effectively set and pursue personal goals. He received the 2007 Canadian Psychological Association Award for Excellence in Teaching and won the Principal's Prize for Excellence in Teaching from McGill University in 2008. Thank you, Professor Kessner, for being here with us today. Now, throughout the um, webinar, to communicate with the organizers and speakers, please use the questions box in your attendee toolbar to the right of your screen or at the bottom of your screen if you are on mobile. If you have a question for the speaker, please send it our way and it will be saved for our dedicated Q&A period at the end of the presentation. Thank you so much. And Professor Kessner, I'll now pass it over to you to begin. Okay, yeah, thank you very much, Antonia. Uh, I just wanna begin by saying I was very excited uh, to talk about this topic because I've actually been struggling with how to stay productive during the pandemic. Uh, we've been in quarantine now for eight weeks and I've been at home and I've started to do something that I haven't done for 20 years, which is I actually sometimes forget to take a shower. I actually went two days without <laughs> remembering to take a shower and go through my daily routine. So, uh, how to stay productive, I think, is a challenge for many of us. And I'll show you what I'm planning to talk about today. I'm first going to talk a little bit about how we might be experiencing the pandemic in different ways. But then I'm going to do these three things. I'm going to give you my usual talk, a brief version of it, about how to set goals and pursue goals effectively. Then I'm going to tell you why my usual advice may not work in a pandemic. And then I'm going to give you some other advice from someone who knows a lot about isolation and uh, monotony. And that's uh, an astronaut named David St. Jacques. He's a Quebecer, a Canadian. And he did an interview with McGill a couple of weeks ago that was very good on this topic. But I'll begin by uh, uh, saying a little bit about how you are all experiencing the pandemic. And I get this material from an American science writer named Amanda Ripley. And she wrote uh, an outstanding book in 2008 about disasters and how we cope with them. And she had uh, been an investigative reporter and a science reporter who interviewed people after 9-11, interviewed people after hurricanes, tornadoes. And uh, I heard an interview with her where she was asked, oh, does everything you learned about disasters help you understand how people will cope with the current pandemic? And she thought it was most similar to what happened after Hurricane Katrina for the people living in uh, New Orleans, because it was a slow moving disaster that took a real long time to recover from. She said something that I, I feel bears repeating and highlighting because uh, I think it's remarkably true. And she said, people are experiencing very different pandemics depending on many different things in their lives. So she was talking to an American audience and she highlighted the fact that your income level or your socioeconomic status uh, will really make this more or less threatening because a lot of people are losing their jobs. She also mentioned that age will be something that will make this pandemic very different. As you probably know, it seems that if someone catches the pandemic, the older they are, particularly if they're over 70, the more at risk they are. However, I would note that in some ways, young people like yourselves, uh, the pandemic really presents difficulties 
because you're at an age where you want to get out there, you want to meet people, you want to figure out what you want to do. And uh, usually there's a lot of outward energy. And instead of being able to pursue the goals you might want to pursue, you've been restricted and constricted. The other thing that factors in is your living arrangement. So I was only able to get away from home and go off to college when I was 20. And I really wanted to leave. But if a pandemic had broken out, and if I was sent back home to Glendale, Queens in New York City with my parents and my brother and sister, I think I would have lost my mind. Uh, so the, the sudden change in living arrangement and whether you're staying with friends or with family, that's probably a, a big adjustment. The other thing I'll say is that where you live, some of you have gone back home to other places. I originally thought that Montreal was a great spot because I was comparing with New York City where I grew up, and that's the epicenter of the worldwide pandemic. But I've since learned that Montreal is like the fifth or sixth worst place in terms of how hard it's been hit. And if I lived in Toronto or Ottawa or Vancouver, I think I'd be experiencing this pandemic differently. Other factors to consider are your health status. So do you have any pre-existing conditions? Uh, I'm hoping none of you had the COVID virus or you didn't have anyone in your family who had it. A couple of days I had a sore throat and a little bit of cough and I couldn't even go back to sleep when I thought that I might be coming down with a cold or a cough because you don't know whether you've caught it. Now, the most interesting thing I've read is that our personality might influence how we deal with the pandemic. In particular, the classic big five trait dimension of introversion versus extroversion. And there's a funny twist that's taken place, which is usually extroverts experience a lot of positive affect because they're assertive, sociable, outgoing. And I think most of us wish that we were more extroverted. Introverts are more quiet, shy, calm, slow paced. But the funny thing is that with this pandemic, there's been a lot of stories about how the introverts are adapting pretty well. They don't mind so much, you know, staying home, having a limited circle of contacts. So here's a Instagram post by Zoe Kravitz. And she says, most people are saying, I'm going crazy in a quarantine. And she, an introvert, is saying, this is my best life. I'm kind of an introvert. So in some ways, uh, I can adapt to uh, the social isolation more easily than an extrovert could. And I can adapt much more easily than an extreme extrovert. But so now I'll having kind of tried to contextualize and, and mention how diverse our experiences are, I'll talk about my area of expertise, which is motivation. And I'll tell you briefly what I would usually tell someone about motivation and the way it comes up. So if I were to meet someone, I'm not meeting many people <laughs> in this pandemic, but if I met someone at the park or one of my daughter's parents, one of my daughter's friend's parents, they would ask me, what do you do? And I would say, well, I study motivation. And then I always get one of two responses. Most often, the person would say, motivation, huh? I need some of that. And what they mean is they need more drive, more focus, more energy. And Almost all of us feel like if we were a little bit more focused and energized, a little bit more motivated, we could do more in our life and our lives would be a little better. The other response I get is, my son needs some of that. But almost always people's response is, I sure could use more motivation. So what I then tell them is, you know, you already find motivation in your life. There's a trick that we all learn when we're pretty young. 
And that is the way to find motivation is to set a personal goal. A goal is a mental, mental representation of something you want to attain. And when you're four years old and you decide you want to learn to ride a bicycle, you realize, okay, if I'm going to learn to ride a bicycle, I have to focus attention, I have to give effort, and I have to persist. Even though I'm going to fall, I have to persist and I have to focus more attention. So there's kind of a universal action plan that uh, springs into action when we set a personal goal. So if someone asked me about how to get motivated, I'd say, think about setting a personal goal. What are you trying to reach? Do you want to exercise more? Do you want to read more? Do you want to write more articles? And then I tell them the conventional wisdom. You've probably heard this on Dr. Phil or some other um, psychology related show. There's something called SMART goals, which is all about how you frame your goals. And it's an acronym. And the advice is your goal should be specific, they should be measurable, they should be achievable, which means it's actually under your control. They should be realistic, so they're challenging but not too challenging. And then you should have some kind of time frame for it. So if I had met you outside, because I'm an introvert, I would stop there and I make an excuse to get away from you. However, because I'm doing this webinar, I'll tell you kind of the rest of the story. Because there's more to goal setting than uh, the consensus about SMART goals. And some of this, actually a lot of it comes from my own research and colleagues who work in the same area. So I'll now share uh, three important points that I've learned in the last 20 years about goal setting. And they've made me feel better about how I've handled my own goals. The first thing I'll tell you, and this may sound bad at first, but you realize it's, it's actually uh, helpful to know. Even with these basics about setting SMART goals, we're still very likely to fail at most of our goals. When I say that, you might say, what's the evidence for that? And I'll just turn that back on you and ask, have you ever tried to set a New Year's resolution, you know, to lose weight, start exercising, uh, meet a romantic partner? Uh, if you have set New Year's resolutions, one of the things you probably learned is that they're very hard to keep. So uh, I would even ask, did you set a New Year's resolution this year? I almost always set three New Year's resolutions. And this year, I can't even remember two of the resolutions. I remember one because I actually did it and it was surprising to me. But I think uh, most of you have kind of realize that it's hard to follow through. And a New Year's resolution is often something very important. And a resolution is, is even a little firmer than just having a goal. So uh, I just want to reassure you, though, that if you have failed at your resolutions, researchers have actually studied resolutions as self-change attempts. And what they find is that on average, it takes six or seven attempts before we succeed at a resolution. And I think that highlights that failing at our goals, surprisingly, is kind of normative. So I'll give you more examples. Here are my three goals from 2019. My first goal, I got this from my daughter. She's 18 years old and she was looking for a new sport that she could play in university. And she decided she wanted to play ultimate frisbee. And I've always thought ultimate frisbee looks cool. So I decided I would try to learn ultimate frisbee. That was a failure. I actually have learned how to throw a frisbee left-handed, right-handed, forehand, backhand. 
but I never got close to a real ultimate Frisbee game. And I'm not even sure that 60 year olds play ultimate Frisbee. It's a, so that was a failure. My second goal was to stop giving my cats so many treats. So here's a picture of two cats who look like my cats. That has not only been a failure, it's an abject failure. And since the pandemic, it's even getting worse because I'm home all the time. And the golden hair cat, she follows me all around all day long, waiting for me to give her a treat. Um, so last year, uh, those two goals were failures. My final goal was to, uh, I've been married 30 years, and I made the New Year's resolution to take walks with my wife every day. That was an embarrassing failure because I didn't even remember <laughs> that I had made that resolution till the next year when I looked at my notes when I was teaching again. So this is all to say that it's is not uncommon to fail at goals. And you know, the interesting question is why do we fail? Okay. So there's three main reasons why we fail. The first has to do with standards. And quite often, we're very ambiguous about what our goal is. So we might say, well, I'm going to study more. I'm going to get better grades. I'm going to do more social things. It's much better to be specific and clear about what you're trying to attain. Because if you're specific and clear, then you can do the second thing you need to do, which is to monitor your progress in relation to the goal. So if you decided you're going to walk more, you should get a Fitbit like I have and actually track how much you're walking. And you'll probably be surprised. Um, some of the things that I would thought would add a lot of steps don't add so many steps. And I found out from my daughter, she went shopping one day downtown and she ended up using 28,000 steps shopping. And I would have never guessed that shopping would give you more steps than doing an aerobics class or something. But it's useful to monitor whether you're meeting these specific standards so you can make adjustments. Because almost always we have to make adjustments. Now the standards and the monitoring, those are what the SMART goals are derived from. So many people know about that already. What you don't know about, and this is what I've really focused on, is the third reason we fail. And that is that maintaining our goals, especially in the face of other goals and distractions and obstacles, it requires self-control. And that's defined as being able to override a short-term consideration in the interest of more valued long-term concerns. So if my goal is to go jogging every day, jogging every other day, I might make up one morning and not really feel like going jogging, but I can exercise self-control by reminding myself why I set that goal, why it's important, and I could kind of push myself with willpower. And unfortunately, there is a problem with willpower when we're pursuing our goals. And the problem arises because there's very good evidence that each of us has a certain limit of how much self-control we can exercise. There's a limit to how much we can push ourselves in a day. And Unfortunately, almost all of us are already at our maximum in terms of using up self-control resources just to go about our complicated and varied lives. So what I always suggest is that we have to remember that our self-control is limited and any time you set a new goal, you're going to have to find extra self-control. Or you have to design that new goal 
in a way that it won't drain your self-control. So there's some things that can be done. One thing, I won't talk about it today, but there's something called an implementation plan where you figure out where, when, and how you're going to pursue the goal. And you try to do it in a way that it will be automatic. So for example, if, if your goal is to drink water, a nice implementation plan is to have uh, a bottle of water wherever you're working so that you can remember to take a drink. So that's one trick. But I'm going to talk about two things that are a little bit more motivational. So just to review, it's normative to fail at our goals. And the reason we're failing is that we're already maxed out. We're using up all the self-control we have every day. Sometimes by four o'clock, we've used it up already and we still have several hours to go. So it's a limited resource. Okay, I have a pictorial example to demonstrate how uh, self-control can be a limited resource. This is a, a photo from 20 years ago. It's my wife and I, it's Christmas day. Christmas day is my wife's birthday. It's three o'clock in the afternoon. And I was at my best in terms of self-control. So there's some subtle things here. I have a nice shirt on. Uh, I had actually taken a shower. My hair is combed, uh, I had shaved, my glasses are on straight, I'm looking alertly into the camera. Uh, this is as good as it gets for me. Now, two years later, on the same day, same time of day, here I am again. So uh, I haven't showered probably for a couple of days, I haven't shaved, I'm wearing sweatpants, I probably haven't brushed my teeth. Uh, I probably didn't take my vitamins. And the only thing that's changed is my daughter was born. Having a child is a wonderful thing, but it actually requires a lot of self-control. There's a lot of things to remember. And for me, it seemed like there were two or three hours more of like these things I had to do. And I was happy to be a parent. But what I noticed is I was slipping everywhere. And the things I had just thought were, you know, living like a normal human being, <laughs> uh, taking showers, uh, taking my vitamins, brushing my teeth. I was forgetting to do that. Now, interestingly, some of those kinds of things have been happening to me during the pandemic. So one hunch I have is that the pandemic is draining my self-control resources more than I realized. Um, I mean, I'm losing track of which day of the week it is, what time it is. Uh, I'll talk about that more later. Okay, so uh, the big problem with goals is where are we going to find the self-control? Uh, now I'm going to make two other points, but then I'm going to get back to where we find it. So the second point about personal goals and why we fail is research suggests we often select goals that are wrong for us and that the personal goals we choose aren't really personal. So if it were personal, that would mean that the goal belongs to you rather than to something or someone else. But our personal goals, there's now evidence, even though they're self-initiated, they're self-generated, they're often not self-endorsed. So that if you look at the goal you're pursuing and you really look at it objectively, sometimes you may realize it's not really me who set this goal. I'm, I'm pursuing this goal because other people are doing it and I think I should do it too. Or other people have told you you should do it. Or a voice inside yourself that's not really you is telling you, you know, you really should try to lose weight. You really should try to get a 4.0 GPA. So in my research, we distinguish between different kinds of reasons you might have. They lead to different kinds of motivation. 
to one type of reason we call autonomous. And this has to do with volition. So you might have a, a, a goal for this year or for the pandemic because it's fun and interesting. Or it might be personally important and valuable. Those are autonomous reasons. And most often, those kinds of reasons connect directly with who you are and who you want to be. And there's no conflict, there's no alienation. And what I would suggest is with an autonomous goal, you don't even feel like you have to find self-control. It's almost natural. And the effort can come easily rather than feeling like you have to push yourself. The problem is, though, many of our goals, they are predominantly based in autonomous reasons. Instead, if you ask people about their goals, they'll tell you, well, somebody else wants me to do it. I'll feel guilty if I don't do it. My self-esteem will be lower if I don't do it. And those are controlled or pressured reasons. So with every goal, it's really important to sort out what's the balance of self-autonomous reasons versus controlled and pressured reasons. So the way we describe this, it has to do with the sense of ownership and personal endorsement. The key distinction is that are you doing this because it's interesting and meaningful or because you feel some kind of pressure to do it? The phenomenology is very different. With an autonomous goal, it feels like, boy, I want to do this. With a control goal, it feels like you have to. Autonomous goal, it feels like, holy cow, I'm lucky that I get to do this. With a control goal, it's I got to do this. And the best description, I think, is an autonomous goal is one you embrace wholeheartedly. All of yourself is behind it. Whereas control goals, you're conflicted and half-hearted. Okay, how am I doing? So, so the first way of overcoming the Self-control limits is by making sure you select and pursue goals that are autonomous. Now, here's the third point and the second way of overcoming the self-control barrier is that you may not realize this, but personal goals are also interpersonal and that we rely on others family and friends to show interest and provide support for our goal pursuits. And you do this too for your family and friends. You know what their goals are. You ask them about it. You see how it's going. You try to support them. And it turns out that when we have interpersonal supports, what that means is we're actually crowdsourcing the demands for self-control. So then instead of like trying to do this all on our own, it feels like there's others uh, working toward the same end. So interpersonal support can be really important. Now, my own research suggests, though, that there's two kinds of support and only one of them really helps us. The other doesn't do harm. It's just kind of no or neutral. So we usually think of support in terms of giving encouragement and guidance and being a cheerleader, maybe problem solving. I would call that directive support. And it turns out that doesn't really help people make progress. What helps is a more subtle, almost invisible kind of support where you show interest, you display empathy and you try to take the other person's perspective. But it's a much lighter touch. So we can measure both kinds of support. And often you'll get both. But I'll give you an example of how not to support someone's autonomy. So my wife a few years ago decided she was going to start jogging. 
She had jogged when she was a university student like you. I thought it was a great idea. Then she explained that she had found a walk, run, walk plan where it would take 10 weeks. And my wife is more detailed and uh, more obsessive than I would be. And she told me the first week she'd uh, go for one minute, then two minutes, and she repeated seven times, run, walk, run, walk. And right away, I thought, no, please, Helen, don't do it this way. It's too laborious. It's too painstaking. But I didn't say anything. So she, for the first two weeks, it went OK. But then she got a cold. She couldn't do it. And she went back to week number one. And at this point, I couldn't hold back. And I said, Helen, you, you, you can't do it this way. You just got to get on the treadmill, hit that start button, and you just go, 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 and go as far as you can, and then do it again the next day. And you won't be surprised to learn that my wife hasn't become a jogger a couple, a couple days later. She kind of gave it up altogether. And I think it's a classic example of, you know, jumping in, being directive, when what I should have done is, is be more empathic and take the perspective that she had. So you would like, ideally, to have some people who are providing support for your goal in this more subtle, empathic way. And my own research suggests that if you have that, you're more likely to make greater progress. Your well-being will increase. <laughs> your relationship with that person will be better. Okay, so my goal success equation, I could trim it down to two things. You should try to make sure you select autonomous goals, and that means interesting, personally meaningful ones. And you should find family and friends who offer autonomy support. Okay, so that would be my usual pitch, and I'm pretty comfortable with it. I believe what I'm saying is true. There's research to back it. But now the question is, is this advice useful during a pandemic? You've probably already noticed that most of the goals that you have, and maybe even some of the goals you felt you succeeded at in previous years, you're no longer able to do them. There are so many obstacles. When you are quarantined at home and you can't go to the YMCA, it's much harder to maintain your fitness. If you're a 20 year old and if you really care about like, getting your social life going, it's really hard to find ways to meet people or make friends. If you're single and living on your own, you know, a pandemic is, is really a difficult thing. Now, so not only are there obstacles, I think there's a lot of little things that we have to do that are draining us. So one thing is I'm in a self-protection mode a lot of the time. So I worry about catching COVID. I worry about giving it to my wife and daughter. So um, I, I, I I do all my shopping now online instead of going to the store. I wash my hands. Uh, I, I do social distancing. I'm wearing a mask. I'm always thinking about, you know, have I followed the protocol? And this is not, I'm kind of a slob. So this is not my natural way of, of doing things. And it takes energy. But because I'm expending self-control on kind of this emergency need to behave differently, I think that's why I'm forgetting about my showers and other things. Now, the other thing I would say is we do rely on friends and family and even acquaintances. Like at the YMCA, I have a guy who I tell my daughter, he's my, he's my life coach. The guy doesn't know it. He just happens to be in the locker room next to me and he gives me really good tips. So I'm always quoting him. But I haven't seen this guy now in eight weeks. Um, so we are isolated from people who might usually support our goal pursuits. So the upshot of this is, oh boy, pandemics and quarantine and social isolation and the monotony, that is tough. Oh, this is the other problem. <laughs> what I care about most at, 
at 20 years old was meeting a partner. And, and how do you do that in a pandemic when you're wearing masks and you can't even see each other? Uh, so I'm going to give you some advice from a, someone who knows more about this and who's an amazing person. His name is David St. Schott. Listen to his resume. He's an engineer, an astrophysicist, a medical doctor, and an astronaut. Uh, and he is an ex he's honed his skills on anxiety, isolation, and uncertainty. And so McGill did an interview with him about what, an, what we can learn about isolation. He spent 204 days on the space station. And he, he, he begins by saying, you know, I know a pandemic is scary, but you can't imagine the risk of being on a space station, being shot into space. But I was amazed at uh, how thoughtful he was. And he recommends uh, four simple rules. Uh, and the first one I've really tried to do. So he said as an astronaut, he had to remember what his mission was and what the meaning and purpose was in all of his sacrifice. Because he actually had to quarantine for a month before he flew to space and a month afterward. And he had a wife and young kids. But he would remind himself why he was doing this. And he recommends that we should remind ourselves why we're doing social distancing, why we're not going to coffee shops, why we're going to start wearing masks, why we're going to do other things. And it's to protect ourselves, to protect our friends, to protect our family, to protect our community. So there's a higher level civic mission. And when you think in those terms, it kind of makes it noble. And it makes it something that you can do volitionally. It's like, I know why I'm doing this. It's personally meaningful. So he says we should think about our sacrifice. And unfortunately, I think university students, the sacrifice is felt very strongly because you're at an age when you want to be with friends and doing things. Now, the second thing he recommends, and he did this in space, and he says you have to find a daily routine. In space, your home and your workspace are the same place. And during the pandemic, for many of us, that's also true. We don't get any buffer zone. We don't get away. It's We do everything right here in our home in front of our laptop. But he recommends you have to find a daily routine. And the routine should separate work and leisure or family. So he says there should be work, there should be exercise, there should be time for connection. And you also need some time to read or knit. I'm not sure if you can knit in space, but to do some interesting crossword puzzles probably don't work in space either, but do some interesting activities. I'll show you. I've taken this to heart. This has really helped me having a daily routine. The third thing he says, within the daily routine, whenever possible, see if you can put yourself in a mental bubble where you're totally focused and absorbed on what you're doing, where you immerse yourself in your daily activity. And that will kind of shut some of the worry and the anxiety down. And it's a really special kind of state when you can enter kind of a mindful flow zone with an activity. I'll show you, I found a couple of things where I could do this. Finally, and sadly, this is something I did not think of. He says, you should focus on helping others. And that when he was on the space station, he was always thinking about how to help the other crew members and also, you know, how to communicate with people back home. And he thinks it's a very positive thing to do. And there is research that helping others not only helps the other person, but it really is good for ourselves. So 
during the pandemic, if you know someone who's a little bit lonelier, who's more isolated, good idea to call them. So those are his rules, and I think they make a lot of sense. And I'll show you. So for the last five weeks, which have gone better than the first three, I'm not taking showers. I have a pretty strict routine. So I get up at eight and I have breakfast. I do this thing, which I usually don't do. I always have honey nut Cheerios, a banana and coffee. Always exactly the same breakfast. And then I go jogging for about an hour because I can't do my spin classes. I can't do my golfing. I figure the one thing I can do is jog. The only problem was I used to really dislike jogging. I mostly curse while I jog. But over the last five, six weeks, I'm finding that I actually like it. So I also listen to a, a audible.com. I'm, I'm in an epic fantasy trilogy. It's actually the third of three trilogies. I'm on book seven. And I find I run and I listen to my story and it's a highlight. It's a great place, great way to start the day. I come home, I have a second breakfast because I've burned like a thousand calories. Then I start some work. Then I watch one of the uh, politicians give an update. It's either Justin Trudeau, I switched to Andrew Cuomo because he's more exciting. Then I have lunch. Then I watch Francois Legault. I've skipped that the last couple of days. It's been kind of depressing. Then I work on research. And then I clean up and I prepare dinner. And with the dinner, I try to do what David St. Jacques said and go into a bubble and really think about what I'm doing. So my best experiment and experience was it so happened that with my online shopping, I often panic. And I ended up about five weeks ago with nine gallons of milk, but no bread. So I looked for a recipe where if you don't have any yeast, uh, you can make bread. And there's something called emergency bread. And it's uh, you just need baking powder. And this is my first version of it. But, but they've become a lot better. And, you know, I took a lot of satisfaction. I'd never made bread in my life. Uh, I even do this and then put pizza toppings on it. And so I have different ways I do it. But, it, it, you know, it was, it was pretty... Uh, engaging. Uh, so after I do the dinner routine, I, I work. And then the other thing, I'm a bad TV watcher. I watch, usually I watch sports and I can't do that. But I, I make sure that I'm always watching some series. So first I watch Stranger Things, all three seasons, eight episodes a season. That wasn't the ideal thing to be watching at nine o'clock. But now I found the perfect show. It's a comedy. My wife suggested it, and all of us watch it, my daughter too, and it's called Schitt's Creek. Uh, some of you won't believe that there's actually a show like that, but it's a Canadian show with two great Canadian comedians. And uh, I thought it would be uh, like for old people, but there's two younger characters who are very funny. And and the, the premise is that these were incredibly wealthy people leading a glamorous jet setting life in New York City when their accountant embezzled all of their money. <laughs> and the only, the only possession that they were allowed to keep was some land in a Canadian town called Shed's Creek. But, uh, so they're now living in a motel with people who they feel are kind of rubes or uh, and they have to adapt. And you, of course, know what the title is from. And I think for many of us during the pandemic, we feel like we're up Shit's Creek and we're leading a very limited life that is without glamour, without people. And I think this is, I just finished season one. It was quite good. I'm sending it to my mom. So that's my routine. And uh, I'll just review now how to stay productive. Uh, I actually think we can't do all the goals we originally thought we could do. And we're probably in a process now, you finish your classes where you're thinking, okay, what kind of goals should I set? 
And I think there's a danger of uh, being too demanding of yourself and trying to do too many things. And I might recommend instead, think about maybe like one or two goals that are interesting and meaningful. Maybe they're even new goals. Like my daughter, she's become interested in public health and she's kind of curious about contact tracing. And, and she's gonna look up that a bit. She's also become really interested in making masks. So she's, she, she can, you can see me here with one of her, the masks that she made. That was the first one. They've become a lot better than that. They're tighter fitting. But think about what goals would be interesting and meaningful and probably be a little flexible and a little more limited. You should really think about who are the people last year and before who are the ones who provide that kind of autonomy support that help you stay with your goals. And then I do think that the astronauts have some good advice and that finding a routine and uh, thinking about what you're doing as a mission, uh, finding a bubble, all of that's very good. But I think that's, yep, that's all I have. So let's see how I did. Oh, I'm not too bad. I finished in 47 minutes. So uh, what I'll do now is if you have any questions, uh, please send them to Antonia. And if Antonia wants to sift through, I imagine it's very hard, Antonia, to sort through those. Hello. Thank you so much, Professor Kessner, for sharing your insights on effective goal setting and ways to stay motivated to be productive while in isolation. It's very, it's a very interesting topic to consider your standards and self-control in our goals while maintaining them through distractions that we find ourselves in right now, such as the pandemic. It's truly a topic I think we can all benefit from in such a time. Um, so we will Thanks. now begin with a couple of questions and some comments from the audience. Uh, a lot of comments came in. Everyone's agreeing about the importance, the importance of self-control and smart goals and using them on planning your daily routine and yeah, adding some a little bit more fun and enjoyment into your work if possible. Someone mentioned how they're driven by their social support and quality conversations. And someone else also, also mentioned that they find that now they're having now they have more video calls um, as a means of communicating and it's become more normalized during the pandemic, they feel like they're getting a little bit more social connection now rather than before, which I guess I, yeah, can I just say I think that's a really great point in that yeah. all of us professors at McGill we've learned how to use Zoom and mm -hmm. uh, we're having teleconferences and I'm still having my lab meetings. And there's one professor in my department who's having pop-up parties, virtual pop-up parties, oh, where wow. uh, we get a glass of wine and we check in and we talk about how things are going. And, you know, it's not the same as seeing people in person, but, it's the best we can do right now. And, and uh, I, I, you know, I'm guessing that university students are, are much better than older people at using uh, social media and uh, staying in touch that way. So that's an advantage. Mm -hmm. And definitely a transition time. A lot of people are learning a lot of new platforms and it's a, it's a time efficient way of connecting for sure. Very yeah. interesting. Um, we do have a couple questions, so I'll start with some questions from the audience. Um, as isolation can play havoc on our mental outlook, can you give advice or tips on how I can keep my outlook positive so as not to dwarf my productivity? What was the last part of it? Um, how I, advice or tips on how I can keep my outlook positive to not I to to stay productive and to not okay. dwarf my productivity. Yes, uh, it's really a I think this gets to the heart of it, and the isolation, uh, it can really get get people down. And I, I think there are some, unfortunately, you know, in a pandemic, you can't help but be a little anxious. Sometimes it's harder to sleep, and if you can't sleep, you don't feel right. So uh, I think that's where the routine can really be helpful. And especially if you put at least a couple things in that routine that you know will be kind of special activities. Uh, the other thing that I think is often good 
uh, is to schedule to talk to someone. So, uh, you know, like uh, 30 years ago, I had something in my life that was quite tragic. And for a year, I couldn't do anything. Uh, first, it was grief, and then it was depression. But one of the things I, I was able to do was there were a couple people who I would make sure I talked to. And it was always at the same time. So it was my sister and a friend. And, uh, you know, that that helps you get through until you feel like yourself again. And uh, uh, I, I think to some extent, that was my first approach with the pandemic too, is okay, let's get through it. And then we, we could go on again. Currently, it's really hard to know what will happen for students. Like, will you be back in September or will you still be at home? Will some of you come back? And that uncertainty uh, can be very worrying, but it's not something we can really control. So again, I, I think it, it may be better to think like an astronaut and just think, okay, what's a good daily schedule to get me through the next three, four weeks? and perhaps keep your ears and eyes open for some new goal that might emerge. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it, it is, a, I, I do want to acknowledge though, it's a really challenging time. And I think it's especially hard for young people because this is not the life you want to be leading right now. Absolutely, thank you for that. Um, someone else also asked, um, if you can provide examples of autonomy support. Yeah, so uh, to some extent, autonomy support is about not doing something. So it, it's, it's, first of all, we have to try to limit uh, the amount of kibitzing we do and the amount of advice giving and the amount of correcting. Uh, and you know, just uh, mindless cheerleading. Autonomy support is more about like showing interest. So let's take the example my daughter's kick is uh, she knows that all of us will have to wear masks. We're not supposed to buy medical masks because healthcare work is needed. So there's a need for what's called artisanal masks. And she knows how to, uh, she knows how to sew, and she used to be in robotics, so she likes figuring out problems. And my approach with her was, uh, oh, that's interesting. Where did you get that idea? And then I would say, oh, what kinds of masks are you thinking about? So it's more open-ended questions. Mm. And uh, uh, the other day I said, oh, how's the mask making going? And <laughs> she discovered, the advantages of having an assembly line. So instead of taking three hours to make one mask, she breaks it down into first she cuts the things and then she attaches the things and then she just does the final part. Now, I can tell you though, that something that's happened, I'm not the one who did this, I'm not gonna say, someone got her interested in like making a company out of it, it like advertising and, uh, trying to market the things. And I personally think that that was a little bit too directive and now she's feeling some pressure and it's becoming too big of a deal. So I think autonomy support would be showing interest, listening, if things go badly to be empathic, but to try to risk just saying something like, boy, <laughs> why, don't, why don't you start a small business? I mean, if she came up with the idea, that would be one thing, but I have a feeling that that's a little bit, you know, that's an example of the directive and jumping in and, and maybe making it into something different than what she had started with. So it's a great question though, in my, I, I work on something called self-determination theory and we focus a lot on autonomy and autonomy support. It's a little tricky to describe because it's, subtle, it's invisible, but you know, one thing I'll say is, you know who's autonomy and supportive because they seem to see things from your eyes. 
and they seem to know what you need. And sometimes what you need is not saying anything, just listening. So it's like the people who seem to listen best and, and not kind of understand you best. That, those are most like the people who are autonomy supportive. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, how would you differentiate between willpower and self-control? Oh yeah, they're alternative. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, I, I think uh, willpower is a more colloquial way of saying the same thing. Uh, there are some finer distinctions, there's self-regulation, self-control, but I, I don't think it's worth, uh, for most of us, I, I, I think you can think of it as willpower, but I would, I would just note that some tasks, you don't need willpower because, you know, they're interesting, they're meaningful, and there's no push that's required. There's enough of a pull and an, an attachment to those tasks, and they're connected enough with yourself. So. I think for most of us, if we could reduce the amount of willpower that we have to exercise in our day, that will free us up. Great. And do you have any further tips, techniques for tracking and uh, your progress and process of goal setting throughout? Yeah, no, that's a really good. Uh, that's a really good question, and most most goal setting researchers would say that. You really should keep track of your goals. So there's a book called Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, where you make a monthly, you talk about your roles and your goals and you track your progress. My own experience is that that becomes very uh, time consuming, keeping track of all of your goals. Some of you probably have apps, like I was doing this app because I wanted to lose a little bit of weight. But it takes a lot of effort to put in everything you're eating every day and to keep doing it. So what I suggest is, uh, you know, probably more intermittent uh, monitoring. Uh, and I like things like with fitness, it's nice to see, for example, uh, can you do 10 push-ups? Can you do five pull-ups? With fitness activities, you can usually see the progression. Uh, and there's ways of doing that. Oh, I'll tell you a really funny one. Uh, my sister-in-law is with her older mother uh, in, in Brockville, Ontario, and she's someone who goes to the YMCA, but she can't do that. And what she did was she invented a parkour circuit. So she lives right next to the St. Lawrence River, and there's a dock. And so she has this thing where she runs up the stairs of the dock, she runs around the house twice, she does some push-ups against the uh, uh, the wall next to the porch, and wow. she's trying to increase the number of times she could do that without like be, being totally fatigued. She only does it every other day or something. But, you know, there's really ways of uh, thinking about what would be a meaningful way to measure and also what would be a fun way. Um, and I recommend that more than laborious, painstaking, okay, I gotta check in every day. And, and the other really important thing is that another personality variable that might place us at risk during a pandemic is perfectionism, especially mm -hmm. self-critical perfectionism. So it's really good to tone that down during this difficult period and don't be too harsh with yourself about your goals. As I said, we fail at most of our goals and then we reset them and maybe we've learned something from the past uh, event, but you know, taking care of yourself and being kind with yourself about your goals is important. <laughs> and see, I've run up to the four o'clock hour. So exactly. maybe I'll stop there and let you say whatever you have to say. Thank you so much. That was a great sum up and uh, wrap up to the webinar. Thank you for being here and spending this time with us, Professor Kessner. And thank you everyone for tuning in. Our next live interrupted webinar is on career planning and recruitment during COVID-19 happening on May 12th, 20, May 12th at, from 6 to 7 p.m. Keep an eye out on your mailbox because we will be sending you an invitation if you'd like to join. We hope to see you at one of our next live interrupted webinars. And thank you everyone for being here. Keep well and stay safe.